Hello again. Thanks for joining us for our chapter book story time today. I'm Miss Erin here at the Caribou Public Library and we are continuing to read Dr. Doolittle, the story of Dr. Doolittle by Hugh Lofting. And we're on chapters five and six today. We don't have a picture at the beginning, but the N is made of fish. So I thought I'd show you that. <laughs> now, oh, fifth chapter is called The Great Journey. Now, for six whole weeks, they went sailing on and on over the rolling sea, following the swallow who flew before the ship to show them the way. At night, she carried a tiny lantern so they should not miss her in the dark. And the people on the other ships that passed said that the light must be a shooting star. As they sailed further and further into the south, it got warmer and warmer. Polynesia, Chi-Chi, and the crocodile enjoyed the hot sun no end. They ran about laughing and looking over the side of the ship to see if they could see Africa yet. But the pig and the dog and the owl, Tutu, could do nothing in such weather, but sat at the end of the ship in the shade of the big barrel with their tongues hanging out, drinking lemonade. They were panting, oh, so hot. Dab Dab the duck used to keep herself cool by jumping into the sea and swimming behind the ship. And every once in a while, when the top of her head got too hot, she would dive under the ship and come up on the other side. In this way, she, too, she used to carry, excuse me, she used to catch herrings on Tuesdays and Fridays when everybody on the boat ate fish to make the beef last longer. When they got near to the equator, they saw some flying fishes coming toward them. And the fishes asked the parrot if this was Dr. Doolittle's ship. When she told them that it was, they said they were glad because the monkeys in Africa were getting worried that he would never come. Polynesia asked them how many miles they had yet to go, and the flying fishes said that it was only 55 miles now to the coast of Africa. And another time, a whole school of porpoises came dancing through the waves, and they too asked Polynesia if this was the ship of the famous doctor. When they heard that it was, they asked the parrot if the doctor wanted anything for his journey. Polynesia said, Yes, we have run short of onions. There's an island not far from here, said the porpoises, where the wild onions grow tall and strong. Keep straight on, we'll get some and catch up to you. So the porpoises dashed away through the sea, and very soon the parrot saw them again, coming up behind, dragging the onions through the waves in big nets made out of seaweed. The next evening, as the sun was going down, the doctor said, Get me the telescope, Chi-Chi. Our journey is nearly ended. Very soon we shall be able to see the shores of Africa. And about half an hour later, sure enough, they thought they could see something in front that might be land. But it began to get darker and darker, and they couldn't be sure. Then a great storm came up with thunder and lightning. The wind howled, and the rain came down in torrents, and the waves got so high they splashed right over the boat. Presently there was a big bang, and the ship stopped and rolled over on its side. What's happened? asked the doctor, coming up from downstairs. I'm not sure, said the parrot, but I think we're shipwrecked. Tell the duck to get out and see. So Dab Dab dived right down under the waves. When she came up, she said that they had struck a rock. There was a big hole in the bottom of the ship. Water was coming in and they were sinking fast. We must have run into Africa, said the doctor. Dear me, dear me. Well, we must all swim to land. But Chi Chi and Gub Gub did not know how to swim. Get the rope, said Polynesia. I told you it would come in handy. Where's that duck? Come here, Dab Dab. Take this end of the rope, fly to the shore and tie it to a palm tree. We'll hold the other end on the ship here. Then those that can swim must, can't swim must climb along the rope until they reach the land. That's what you call a lifeline. So they all got safely to the shore, some swimming, some flying. Those that climbed along the rope brought the doctor's trunk and handbag with them. But the ship was no good anymore, with the big hole in the bottom, and presently the rough sea beat it to pieces on the rocks, and the timbers floated away. Then they all took shelter in a nice dry cave that they found high up in the cliffs until the storm was over. Mm, here's a picture of the ship. They had run into Africa. <laughs> Dear old Africa, Oh, when the sun came out the next morning, they went down to the sandy beach to dry themselves. 
Dear old Africa, sighed Polynesia, it's so good to be back. Just think, it'll be 169 years tomorrow since I was here, and it hasn't changed a bit. Some old palm trees, some old red earth, same old black ants. There's no place like home. And the others noticed that she had tears in her eyes. She was so pleased to see her old home once again. Then the doctor missed his high hat, for it had been blown into the sea during the storm. So Dab Dab went out to look for it. Presently, she saw it a long way off, floating on the water like a toy boat. When she flew down to get it, she found one of the white mice, very frightened, sitting inside of it. What are you doing here? asked the duck. You were told to stay behind in Puddleby. I didn't want to be left behind, said the mouse. I wanted to see what Africa was like. I have relatives there. So I hid in the baggage and was brought onto the ship with the hardtack. When the ship sank, I was terribly frightened because I cannot swim far. Swam as long as I could, but I soon got all exhausted and I thought I was going to sink. And then, just at that moment, the old man's hat came floating by. I got into it because I did not want to be drowned. There she is, find, or Dab Dab, finding the hat with the mouse in it. <laughs> so the duck took took up the hat with the mouse in it and brought it to the doctor on the shore. And they all gathered around to have a look. That's what you call a stowaway, said the parrot. Presently, when they were looking for a place in the trunk where the white mouse could travel comfortably, the monkey, Chi Chi, suddenly said, shh, I hear footsteps in the jungle. They all stopped talking and listening and listened. And soon a man came down out of the woods and asked them what they were doing there. My name is John Doolittle, MD, said the doctor. I've been asked to come to Africa to cure the monkeys who are sick. You must all come before the king, said the man. What king? asked the doctor, who didn't want to waste any time. The king of the Jolaginki, the man, an the man answered. All these lands belong to him, and all strangers must be brought before him. Follow me. So they gathered up their baggage and went off following the man through the jungle. Chapter six is called Polynesia and the King. Again, no picture, but the W is made out of a building and some palm trees. <laughs> when they had gone a little way through the thick forest, they came to a wide, clear space, and they saw the king's palace, which was made of mud. This was where the king lived with his queen, Ermintrude, Ermintrude, excuse me, Ermintrude, and their son, Prince Bumpo. The prince was away fishing for salmon in the river. But the king and queen were sitting under an umbrella before the palace door, and the queen, Ermintrude, was asleep. When the doctor had come up to the palace, the king asked him his business, and the doctor told him why he had come to Africa. You may not travel through my land, said the king. Many years ago, a man came to these shores. I was very kind to him. But after he had dug holes in the ground to get the gold and killed all the elephants to get their ivory tusks, he went away secretly in his ship without so much as saying thank you. Never again shall such a man travel through the lands of Jol Joliginki. Then the king turned to some of the men who were standing near him and said, Take away this medicine man with all his animals and lock him up in my strongest prison. So six of the king's men led the doctor and all of his pets away and shut them up in a stone dungeon. The dungeon had only one little window, high up in the wall with bars in it, and the door was strong and thick. Then they all grew very sad, and Gub-Gub the pig began to cry. But Chi-Chi said he would spank him if he didn't stop that horrible noise, and he kept quiet. Are we all here? asked the doctor, after he'd gotten used to the dim light. Yes, I think so, said the duck, and started to count them. Where's Polynesia? asked the crocodile. She isn't here. Are you sure? said the doctor. Look again. Polynesia? Polynesia, where are you? I suppose she escaped, grumbled the crocodile. Well, that's just like her. Sneaked off into the jungle as soon as her friends got into trouble. I'm not that kind of a bird, said the parrot climbing out of the pocket of the tail of the doctor's coat. You see, I'm small enough to get through the bars of that window, and I was afraid they would put me in a cage instead. 
So while the king was busy talking, I hid in the doctor's pocket. Here I am. That's what you call a ruse, she said, smoothing down her feathers with her beak. Good gracious, cried the doctor. You're lucky I didn't sit on you. Now listen, said Polynesia. Tonight, as soon as it gets dark, I'm going to creep through the bars of that window and fly over to the palace. And then, you'll see, I'll soon find a way to make the king let us all out of prison. Oh, what can you do? said Gub-Gub, turning up his nose and begin to cry again. You're only a bird. Quite true, said the parrot, but do not forget that although I'm only a bird, I can talk like a man, and I know these people. So that night, when the moon was shining through the palm trees and all the king's men were asleep, the parrot slipped out through the bars of the prison and flew across to the palace. The pantry window had been broken by a tennis ball the week before, and Polynesia popped in through the hole in the glass. Oh, here she is, sneaking out of the prison bars. She heard Prince Bumpo snoring in his bedroom at the back of the palace. Then she tiptoed up the stairs until she had come to the king's bedroom. She opened the door gently and peeped in. The queen was away at a dance that night at her cousin's, but the king was in bed fast asleep. Polynesia crept in very softly and got under the bed. Then she coughed, <clears throat> just the way Dr. Doolittle used to cough. Polynesia could mimic anyone. The king opened his eyes and said sleepily, is that you, Ermintrude? He thought it was the queen come back from the dance. Then the parrot coughed again, loud like a man, and the king sat up wide awake and said, who's that? I am Dr. Doolittle, said the parrot, just the way the doctor would have said it. What are you doing in my bedroom, cried the king. How dare you get out of prison? Where are you? I don't see you. But the parrot just laughed, a long, deep, jolly laugh, like the doctor's. Stop laughing, laughing and come here at once so I can see you, said the king. Foolish king, answered Polynesia. Have you forgotten that you are talking to John Doolittle, M.D., the most wonderful man on the earth? Of course, you cannot see me. I've made myself invisible. There is nothing I cannot do. Now listen, I have come here tonight to warn you. If you don't let me and my animals travel through your kingdom, I will make you and all your people sick like the monkeys. For I can make people well, and I can make people ill just by raising my little finger. Send your soldiers at once to open the dungeon door, or you shall have mumps before the morning sun has risen on the hills of Jalaginki. Ooh, you think it will work? Then the king began to tremble and was very much afraid. Doctor, he cried, it shall be as you say. Do not raise your little finger, please. And he jumped out of bed and ran to tell the soldiers to open the prison door. As soon as he was gone, Polynesia crept downstairs and left the palace by the pantry window. But the queen, who was just letting herself in at the back door with a latch key, saw the parrot getting out through the broken glass. And when the king came back to bed, she told him what she had seen. Then the king understood that he had been tricked and he was dreadfully angry. He hurried to the prison at once. But it was too late. The door was open, the dungeon was empty, the doctor and all of his animals were gone. <laughs> That's it for today. We'll continue on with chapters seven and eight next time. Have a great night. Until then.